we're an entertainment company first. Like we don't want to make marketing. We want to make people laugh. And we want to be the funniest thing in someone's feed every day. Yeah. That's our goal. I'm Tom Ward, and over the last couple of years, I've had the chance to sit down with some of the biggest celebrities and influencers in the world. What I've always found most fascinating is the stories of the businesses that they've built behind the scenes. On this show, you'll get an inside look of what it takes to build a successful business from some of the biggest celebrities, business people, and up and coming entrepreneurs in the world. This is The Tom Ward Show. Hey guys, welcome to the Tom Ward Show where we talk to the biggest entrepreneurs in the world. And today I've got such an entrepreneur. We've got Mike Cesario, founder of Liquid Death Water. I heard you say that the company is all branding, which I think you're exaggerating a little bit because obviously it's a great product, um, you know, great water imported from the Alps. But you're really pretty on because, and I'll give you a story why. I've seen your ads on Instagram for ever, right? I'm scrolling, there it is. And it always attracts me, right? So I do a lot of prep for these things. So I'm kind of going through your website and going through your personal history and all that stuff. And I'm like checking out the merch. I'm like, I'm gonna buy a hoodie and a t-shirt like right now. And then I'm like, I can't really buy it if I've never tried the product. <laughs> so let me at least try one first and then I can get the merch. Yeah. You know, where did you learn or get your branding chops because I mean, I can't name a brand off the top of my head that, that's doing it better right now, especially on social. Well, I think packaged goods and beverage is traditionally a space where there's not a lot of really powerful brands. It, it's way more of a functional based approach that most brands take. Oh, we have this ingredient. It's unique. Yep. Why should you buy this over another one? Well, because this one has more electrolytes or there's functional things. But you step away from beverage and other things like look at apparel. Like you have a Rolex watch. Okay. You could have another watch that costs $10 that tells time just as good. Yep. Looks exactly, exactly like that. Same. Yep. There's no real functional benefit. No. But you're willing to invest because there's a brand. It means something. They've spent a lot of time, money over years to make people associate something with that brand and there's an emotional reason, not a rational one. There's no oh, rational reason to have that, right? No. And I think people understand that in fashion a lot quicker. Like the average person's like, oh, even though I wouldn't buy a $700 Prada t-shirt. <laughs> you know, I, I, I understand why some people would. I get it's a brand thing, even yeah. though you can buy the same t-shirt made from the same materials, performs the same function at Target. Yep. For, 12 bucks, yep. they understand brand there. But in CPG, since it's traditionally such a like functional based thing, people are like, wait a second, it, it's all brand? I don't I don't get it. But if you just kind of step away, I think it clicks for people. Oh, I now it starts to make sense. Yeah, in beverage, the only truly powerful, valuable brands are maybe like Red Bull. The extreme in your face. Well, they've just built a thing that goes beyond the liquid. Like people don't, Red Bull doesn't have 25 million followers on social because everyone loves their ingredient profile. No. <laughs> yeah, it goes beyond the liquid. Formula They're, One team. Yeah, athletes yeah. doing crazy things. They entertain people. The brand means more to people than the liquid. The liquid's a part of it, Yeah, but it means more than that. And I think that's what the definition of a valuable brand is. When your brand transcends simple functionality. So you took a pretty simple product. We're selling water here, yeah, right? right yeah. There is a million water brands out there. So did you have, does it come brand identity first and then go, okay, what product can we kind of align ourselves with to do this? Like, did you have the image of liquid death and kind of the tone and the voice of the brand and everything first? And then did you decide on water as being the product or how does it work? Well, we had the idea of the general concept, which was, it was really only unhealthy brands like alcohol, junk food, that would do all the really funny, irreverent, cool marketing. Like you think of most of the funniest ad campaigns of all time that people remember. It's like Budweiser, Bud Light, Cheetos, Doritos, Snickers. Like it's all junk food and alcohol does all the cool, fun marketing. Where yeah. healthy brands never marketed that way. Like it's always very quiet, calm. Yeah, it's not about fun. There's no logical reason for why soda is more fun than water or more fun than any other thing. It's yeah, like- it's a drink. Yeah, yeah, tons of people drink all kinds of things 
Um, it, it's literally just like a marketing thing that they decided to invest in. It's just the health food industry just never chose to invest in fun as part of their brand. And the voice, you're 100% right on that because when I think of healthy products, I think of like yoga mats and granola and calm and tranquil. Like I'm a healthy guy. I don't relate to that at all. I like the box. I like the lift weights occasionally. Yeah, right, like, yeah. I don't resonate with that at all. Right. But water super healthy. And I think does your background because we were talking before about music and you were you grew up and probably still are a metal and punk rock fan. And I think when a lot of people think about that demographic, they think of people strung out or off up, right? But what they don't realize is when you look at a Henry Rollins or you look at um, Ian McCain and guys like that, you know, and the whole straight edge movement, like you can be healthy and, and kind of extreme and cool at the same time. Like, was that an inspiration for you as you're kind of bringing this to life? I think <laughs> there's a lot of stereotypes across all areas of things, you know, and it's like, and people just assume this is what punk rock is, or this is what, I mean, yes, I listen to Slayer and Deicide and metal bands, but I also listen to, uh, you know, Adele and Nora Jones and Jay-Z and Chris Christopherson. And like, and I think most people are most more- Most people are like that. Yeah, are more not one thing. And I think a lot of marketing tries to think, oh, if you listen to punk rock, you are this, or if you listen to Jay-Z, then you are this. But the reality is it's it's way more gray. And I think, again, outside of beverage, and I, I use this reference a lot, but like think about entertainment, like movies. Okay. What's the demographic of someone who goes see goes and sees a horror movie? You know, like I don't know. Jordan Peele, Get Out, one of the biggest movies that year, horror movie. Yep. Death, blood, destruction. Was it heavy metal guys that went and made that movie, a $200 million movie? No, it, no, was, it was a wide, regular people. Yeah, wide range of people that just have a taste for a particular type of entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, I also bring up the stat like years ago, you know, The Walking Dead, a show about flesh eating zombies was the number two most popular show for Among women. women. Yeah. Yep. But people don't know that or even think about it. Don't think about it, right. And if you were marketing to women, how many people are using a zombie campaign to market to women, even though the data's there. They're using lifetime movies. Yeah, it's like, again, yeah. they revert to these like low hanging fruit stereotypes that often are not true or even that effective. Yeah, hey, is that true with you? Because when I was looking at this too, I go, okay, it's probably a male demo, right? But then I was thinking, there's a lot of badass women out there and I bet they would love this branding and love like, I'm sober. So like to me, that's a perfect drink to drink at a bar. It's like a conversation starter. So. Do you have a large women um, demographic too? We do, yeah. And it's probably one of the fastest growing. It's like, yeah, out of the gate liquid death, the low hanging fruit was dudes. Of course. So of course it was like, maybe it was like 75% kind of male in the very early days. Now I think it's we're more like 40% women or more. Wow, that's you incredible. Know? And you just, if you go on social and look up hashtag liquid death, on Instagram and just scroll through the people who are naturally posting. I mean, lots of women, like it's it's not it's not all metal dudes. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. you kind of get to see, you know, and even though the brand has a what you'd maybe call more metal aesthetic to it. Yeah. But in the same vein, horror movies have a visual metal aesthetic to them but the entertainment value goes beyond just what the aesthetic is. And there's a lot of people who can appreciate the comedy of, of what we do. Because at the end of the day, we're not being serious. Anyone who likes us doesn't think, oh, Liquid Death thinks it's so bad. At it's like, no, everyone gets the joke yeah. that we're sort of making fun of all this big corporate extreme marketing that's we've been watching for decades. Dude, I always do a lot of prep for these and I was checking out your website and I actually saw the uh, gentleman downstairs who's like the website guy. I was like, you do incredible work because there's two things on the website that would just made me laugh. One is the woman shotgunning a can of water, right? Yeah. It's like so ridiculous, yeah. but funny. And then the other one reminded me of like a Mountain Dew commercial where the guy is drinking a can, jumping out of an airplane. 
Oh yeah, the like skydiver. The skydiving yeah. guy, yeah. It's like this is we're like we're so extreme, we're so badass, and you're kind of the way I take that as the viewer is like it's kind of tongue in cheek. Like guys, we're selling water here. We're just going around. Yeah, I mean, we don't take this seriously. There's no such thing as an extreme beverage, you know. <laughs> yeah. there's, like there's no reason that drinking an energy drink makes you a better skydiver. <laughs> you know, in fact, like a lot of these extreme sports athletes who are sponsored by energy drinks they don't actually drink them. Like they're legit athletes with trainers that are like very careful what they put in their body. Yeah. And, oh yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of, it It really is sort of bullshit. It's just like, it's a marketing gimmick that they've tapped into and they owned at a period of time when other brands weren't coming after action sports athletes. Energy drinks kind of came in and like, were the only people writing checks to these people. So mm -hmm. they're like, hey, I'm a punk band. I don't have a lot of source of money and this company wants to give me money. I'll take the money. Yeah even if I don't drink the product. Yep. Um, but water, I think, is something that everybody actually drinks. And it's, I think, especially, you know, we don't, we haven't gone heavy after action sports stuff. Okay. Because these big energy drink companies, I mean, Monster's valued at 50 billion. Oh my God. One of the highest performing stocks of the last 30 years. Wow. Red Bull's probably valued at 60, 70 billion at least. Wow. So these are massive companies with huge checkbooks. Like we're not gonna go in and try to buy our way into action sports. Like, yeah. you know. Um, so we always, you know, in the early days, we focus heavily on music because musicians, they have a way to make income beyond sponsorships. Athletes, it's hard. That's why you'll see pro athletes who are decked head to toe in a particular brand because yep. endorsement deals especially for action sports, that's really how they make their living. They have to do that stuff. Musicians make money touring, merch, selling merch, yeah. licensing deals. Like you'll never see a whole band dressed head to toe in, in, in a brand because yeah. they don't need to do that. You yeah. know? And we know that from a cool factor standpoint, people would much rather promote Liquid Death than a lot of this other kind of th these other brands. So, and the other difference too, think about it, you're a music nut who came up in the scene. I think musicians are trusted more because there's always and there always will be the fear of selling out. Even though it's more acceptable now in the days of TikTok and influencers selling and hoodies and everything else they sell, for bands, it's still cool to kind of be not dressed head to toe like a NASCAR driver, yeah, right? Yeah, it's yeah. cool to like, nah, man, you don't see me endorsing anything and I'm cool and I'm doing it. So I think if you get a musician to kind of endorse your product, to me at least, as just a casual viewer, it carries more weight to me than the extreme sports guy with a can of liquid death in his hand. Yeah, Do you think that's true? Because I think you would, to your point, a musician, you don't see them do as many of these deals. So you know if they're doing something, they probably are legitimately into it. Mm -hmm. They're not, they don't need the money for that. No. You know, and now when it's a huge brand, like I think, I don't think people see when Coca-Cola gets some huge celebrity, I don't think they're like, oh, they must really love that. It's like, no, they know they're making millions and millions of dollars on that. Yeah. But for like these smaller brands that don't have multi-million dollar celebrity budgets, like if someone's promoting something, they know that there's probably a better chance that they're legitimate fans of the brand. And it's it's more of a special, unique thing than, yeah, how many, other, what other places do you see tons of upstart brands just instantly yeah, getting endo you know people to endorse it. Where, and I think even just the endorsement stuff in general, it's it's not as effective as it was. And like we don't. Do you do a lot of collabs? I want to talk about the Martha Stewart one later. Yeah, yeah, because no, that's incredible. But do you do a lot of like collabs with athletes, musicians, influencers? I mean, we've our approach to using celebrities has been more similar to the way like Saturday Night Live uses celebrities. It's like we've created our own comedy machine that is liquid death that's got our own tone of voice and unique thing and we bring these celebrities kind of into our little machine and we create this custom content with these people where you're likely seeing them in a way you've never seen them before just like saturday night live it's like yeah these you know serious actors go on there to not take themselves too seriously or politicians or politicians yeah. yeah and they go on there and they do it's like oh i've never seen this pro football player act like an ass and it's it's really funny. Yeah. Um, that's more been our approach where we're not just having someone drink our product and be, 
ah, that's what I drink, you know, because no one believes that anymore. Yeah. Um, so for us, it's we're an entertainment company first. Like we don't want to make marketing. We want to make people laugh. And we want to be the funniest thing in someone's feed every day. Yeah. That's our goal. Um, now, how do you, people, individuals, companies spend millions and millions of dollars to branding consultants to figure this shit out, right? What's our tone of voice? Who are we? What's the perfect avatar? All this nonsense, right? right. You somehow have figured this out. Now, previously you worked at Netflix and some companies, but famously for Gary Vee too, right? Where did you learn all this stuff? Well, I mean, part of the advice that we would, or I would try to give to companies when I was working in more of the service industry of like, yeah. oh, we help you make marketing and brand. I've always had a point of view that a company's tone of voice and brand really can't be that much different than the top decision maker. So you can hire all these creative people that want to make this cool brand, but if the guy at the top who has to approve everything doesn't like it, doesn't understand it, it's never going to be never see the light of day, or they're going to water it down in a way where it's not really what it is, and it's this weird hodgepodge of stuff that goes out. So I always tell people the simplest way to create a strong brand is literally have your brand mimic the people who run the company. Like if the CEO is really into tennis and knows tennis better than anybody else and is a guy that understands the worlds of like high class culture, build your brand around that because you know it better than anybody else. And when it comes time to make a decision, what's our avatar, what's our tone of voice, it's way easier to make that decision because you're the one that is it's replicating you, yep. you know, and if you find a way to make your brand work in that voice, that's the way that you can truly have a, an authentic and powerful brand because you're not trying to be something that you're not at a core. You're not, you know, like, yeah, you and you can try and, and brands do it, but it's a lot more expensive and it's a lot harder because the guy making the decisions doesn't know how to make the decision on the brand because, oh, that's not me. So. How do I know? Oh, I got to hire a guy that knows, but then I got to trust that the guy knows. And then I got to hire these people that know how to make this thing because there's not a clear direction from this guy. So it just gets a lot harder to do. But the easiest way is if you can find a way to make your brand a reflection of you who's running the company, the decisions get a lot easier. Oh, yeah, no, don't do that. Do that. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. I would do this. Yeah. So where do you learn this stuff? Back to the question, like how did you figure all this out? Because I've never, that is so insightful. I've never heard anyone talk about that when they're talking about brand building for a company. Because when I think of that, I think of just the situation you described. The CEO of Procter & Gamble. You know, I'll make a mass generalization. Probably an old white guy, right? Yeah, right Maybe yeah. he likes golf or whatever. Yeah, right. But he's got a ton of these products that have nothing to do with him or his interests or his likes. But yet he's still got to sell a, an air freshener or whatever he's selling. So that's how I picture most companies working. But it makes so much sense the way you describe it. And why are people getting it wrong? Are they just trying to be somebody they're not? And, and Procter & Gamble, it, to your point, it is an extreme example where that's like a bajillion dollar yeah, company that has course. all these brands. And it's, it's a little bit of a different game there. But if you're just yeah. talking about you're trying to get a brand you're trying to build a brand from scratch yep. and you're running that brand. You know, you always like one of the best pieces of advice I've got as an entrepreneur is like, you've got to find out what do you care about more than the average person, know about more than the average person. And in theory, will have more fun working harder on than the average person because you have to have a competitive advantage. 100%. So trying to find like what is it that you know or understand better than most other people and try to make your brand around that because now you're already baking in the competitive advantage about, especially when you go to raise money, the big question isn't, is your idea the right idea? It's, is this the right person to execute this idea. Founder first, right? Founder Who's the right. founder? Do we believe in him? Yeah. Or so many investors say that we don't invest in ideas, we invest in people. Huh? Yep. Um, so if you start there as you're starting a company, it's like, how am I the right exact person to do this? Because it's leveraging 
my own personal background, knowledge, interests, where I know about this more than the average person does, you're already going to be so far ahead of these people who are trying to, you know, just create something that they're not. And then they got to go find the right person to execute it. Again, it just gets a lot more expensive, takes more time. And in any kind of startup, I mean, speed is everything. So were you working at the time? Is this all going on in the background? And it is, yeah. You're looking at statistics of beverage sales and this whole thing as you're working your day job. Yeah, working my day job, you know, not super happy in my day job, like not making anything terribly creative. It's just kind of, again, <laughs> I've been paying there. the bills kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was my side project that when I had time, I would keep kind of like noodling on um, until eventually it was, you know, this fully formed thing. And it wasn't, a lot of people think, you know, all these genius ideas, you just think of it in the shower one day. It's like, no, it was this piece of wood that like I chopped away at for a year or two until you finally had like, okay, now we have what this should be and all the details figured out and thought through. Um, it, it was meticulous. And it sounds like like your approach and your skill set, it didn't have to be water, you know, me looking from the outside, I go, I look at you and go, he could have probably made screwdrivers work or whatever the product yeah. happened to be. Yeah. It just happens to be water. Yeah. And I think we're kind of proving that's the case that we started off as, you know, still water in a can. Very different product category, like you're competing against Fiji and all these other like premium still water brands. And then we were starting to like, beat those guys in the retailers where we were being sold. Then we launched Premium Sparkling, which is the black can. Now you're competing against Perrier, San Pellegrino, completely different set and even different customer yep. than water. It's not There's not a lot of overlap there. Yep. So winning against those brands in a different category with kind of a different product. Then we just launched the Flavored Sparkling this past January, which is almost more like a healthy soda because we use three grams of agave in it to give it a little bit of sweetness and flavor because we want it to be different than all the zero cow, zero taste <laughs> LaCroix they, brand. They really are zero taste. Yeah, there, there was an internet meme where it was like, LaCroix tastes like someone whispered a fruit name in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, so, and then now our flavors are insanely successful and we're like the number two sparkling on Amazon. After, I mean, we, we made that, like it was three months of selling on Amazon. We were the number two sparkling on Amazon. Wow. So I think it's showing that having a, a, a truly powerful brand, it transcends like individual product categories. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, it can be, it is a much bigger thing. That's why we're able to sell merchant apparel, even though like you don't see many beverage companies. Forget it. Have I ever seen a wa someone wearing a water brand hoodie in my life? Never. Yeah. Perrier, Fiji water. No one, I'm sure they're out there somewhere. I mean, what you do see is like long established legacy brands. Like Coca Cola. You, yeah, maybe wear. Budweiser. Sure. You know, but these are brands that are worth $200 billion. Like they've got a hundred years of brand building. Yep. To, to lean on. Yeah. And then they're finally, you know, they're able to do it. They weren't always able to do it. No. But, so yeah, I think that's that's been our approach is like it, we're building a brand and the brand is bigger than just water in a can. Yeah. So you've got water in a can. Now, why the Alps? Are you insane? If I don't know anything about water or the beverage industry, but I go, okay, I want to put it in a can. There's got to be a reason no one else has put it in a can. It's probably hard, right? But I see the benefits. And then two... I want something close by to reduce, like I don't want to ship water from Fiji. That's got to be expensive. We're a startup. I'm like, I don't know, there's fresh springs in the US somewhere and where you're from, right? In Pennsylvania, there's some great springs you could use. Why the Alps and why cans? Cans because as we were developing the idea for Liquid Death in a water company, you know, one thing that was starting to pop up at that time, which was like 2000, 17 ish was when this was when the, kind of the, the early stages of liquid death. You started to see all this backlash against plastic, single use plastic oh, was yeah. popping up more and more. Hotel chains 
we're saying, hey, we're going to be eliminating single use plastic by X year. So it was becoming, it was almost like plastic was almost becoming like the new tobacco. Yeah, 100%. You know, like people were against it. So it's like, okay, well, you know, we don't necessarily think it makes sense to put water in this shitty thing that people mm -hmm. don't want. So what about cans? And it's like, oh, well, cans are cool because it just, it looks cool. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it doesn't feel like water. It would stick out in the category. And then again, digging into it more, it's like, oh, cans are infinitely recyclable. Like you can recycle them over and over again. And the more you dig, it's like, oh, actually the entire recycling industry is built on cans because- Plastic recycling is a sham. It's a sham, yeah. Yep. No one wants it. China doesn't even want it anymore. Yeah, it, it is not economically viable to recycle. And there's more and more things coming out where it's, I mean, lobbyists dating back to the early 80s when people were starting to get worried about plastic when it was having a huge boom. Mm -hmm. And they wanted everyone to just, oh no, it's recyclable. <laughs> but to your point, a lot of what was getting marked as recycled was just product that was getting shipped to China. And they could say, oh, that was recycled. Mm -hmm. um, now that China has said, no, we don't want it anymore. Now you look at the recycling rates and there's new figures coming out. That's like 5% of plastic is actually getting recycled, mm -hmm. not 30%. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we knew that cans, they checked a lot of boxes also. Yeah. It's like, oh, cooler format, you know, better option in terms of recyclability. Seems like your demo too, younger, definitely more eco-conscious than generations before too. Yeah, so that, yeah. that helps. Yeah, everybody's more yeah. health conscious, more eco-conscious. Sure. Um, but yeah, once we decided, okay, we want to do, you know, natural spring water in a can. You know, a lot of these big water companies are just purified municipal tap, where they basically strip all the good and bad out of the water. They add a tiny, tiny little bit of mineral back into it. But it's, it, I mean, it's highly processed tap water, right? <laughs> that doesn't sound that appealing for spending a premium on a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. So we knew that, hey, as a premium product, one thing people do care about water is the source. Like people, oh, it's from France or it's from a mountain, it's from a spring. I'll pay three bucks for yeah, that. Yeah, that, that feels like, you know, and, and it's not, it's same thing with like Whole Foods. Like people yeah. like natural things. Oh, this is natural. Like it, it has a higher perceived value. It's not a highly processed thing. Mm -hmm. So when it came to finding who could produce this in the US, there was not a single bottler who could put spring water in cans. Why? Because canning operations are insanely expensive. Like you're talking hmm. 15, $20 million investments for big canning capabilities at the source because it's way too expensive to try to tanker truck water from a spring source halfway across the country to a bottler. Like you would go under. So what happens? Does Fiji make the bottles in Fiji then ship the bottles? Well, no, Fiji's plastic. There's a lot of springs. Oh, yeah, I guess yeah, so, yeah. There's a lot of springs that can do spring water in plastic bottles in the U.S. There's oh, yeah, endless. I guess so, yeah, There's sure. just no one who could, who could do it in cans at oh, scale. Gotcha, okay. So it didn't exist, so. So what, did you have to make a canning thing in the Alps? No, we just opened our search up to Europe. We said, hey, okay, there's no one in the U.S. who can do this. Maybe okay. there's someone in Europe that can do it. And we found this place in Austria that, you know, they had, you know, their own spring sources and they had canning capabilities. And we flew out, we met with them really liked them and you know we just started working with them and you know the economics at the time of producing and you know even we had to ship it to the US you know there was can shortages in the US where people couldn't get cans there there was a lot more cost where it wasn't even that much it wasn't even really more expensive in a lot of scenarios it was actually cheaper um so we're like okay this this is where we'll at least start out doing it um you know will we stay in Austria forever Probably not. Like now that like it's become more of a category, there's a lot more quality spring water options that can can in yeah. the U.S. So it, it you know obviously it's better when we don't have to always ship water over the ocean <laughs> yeah, you know, eventually. Course. But it was just kind of that's where we had to start, and now I think we're getting closer to like hey maybe eventually we we bring it we bring it here to the U.S. once we find a quality source and, and all of that. So you go back to getting the funding, right? So you get your funding. Where did you get the funding anyway? To start this thing? Our first real like venture backer was a company called Science Inc. Okay. And they were behind Dollar Shave Club. That, that oh, brand, yeah. Okay. Um, very well versed in like the direct to consumer packaged goods kind of space um, where, you know, cool brands want to dis disrupt big industries. Mm -hmm. 
razors or water. Yeah. Um, so they, they were kind of our first real partners and they've sort of been, you know, true partners to us throughout the entire life cycle of the company. And since then, we brought in tons of different kind of institutional investors and angel investors and all of that throughout all of our different rounds of funding. Sure. But OK, so you're you got the idea for the company. You've mapped it all out. You got your check. All right. Now we go. Now, I'm guessing it took a lot of time from getting that check to figuring out, OK, someone in Austria can can water. And how do we bring it over? And how what quantities do we buy in and all this stuff? And then we also, hey, by the way, we got to get it in the store so people can buy it. How long did it take from I got the check to I sold a can in a store? What does that look like? Well, we actually had to figure out a lot of that stuff before the check comes. Oh, you have to have it all mapped out yeah, first. because nobody wants to write a check for you to go figure it out. <laughs> yeah, right? true. You need to de-risk the deal <laughs> as much as possible. Okay. So once we, you know, we launched Liquid Death as if it was a real product on Facebook first, even though we didn't have real product. We said, we did like a 3D render of a can. We shot this funny $1,500 commercial using a fake can. Huh. And we made it seem real just to kind of test the idea first because... Let's just see how people react. To Proof this. of concept. Proof of concept. Yeah, yep. in a, a low cost way, where if it doesn't work, we're out a few grand. grand. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, but then you know, four months in, the video had like three million views, <laughs> and the page had you know eighty thousand followers, which was you know more than Aquafina. That on is Facebook. genius. And then, so you can take that to the VCs. Yeah. So then now. you take that. To, not even just the VCs. The very very first money we raised was just sort of like that friends and family money, like former bosses of mine. It's like, here, I'll write a 5K check. Got I'll write a 10K check. And you kind of mass together maybe like 150 grand just to do a, a, a limited, like the smallest production run you can do. Mm -hmm. But even before then, I had this social traction. Then I had to figure out where were we going to produce it and what was the cost going to be. So I had to like really figure that out. So then once I had the Austria producer, I had pricing. We could really map out. Oh, I got it. Okay. And then... The friends and family are like, oh, yeah, this is together. Yeah. Like, <laughs> there's a producer. They know what it's going to cost. They know yeah. what they're going to do. And then once we actually had physical product, then the institutional investors will start taking it more seriously. Oh, these guys actually have it figured out. They've, they've got physical product in hand. Now we feel like this is more de-risked and, and we can get involved. And that's kind of been like the whole raising process is like you're showing more and more traction that continues to further de-risk what the success of the company will be. You know, and I think there's a great lesson in there. I interviewed this guy, his, his Instagram handles boy with no job. And he's like a meme page kind of, right? He's got a million and a half followers, but there's a lot of people like that. So anyway, long story short, he wanted to create like an um like a wine-based sparkling beverage. And you know, he successful when he launched and got all the money. It's doing well and everything. And I asked him too, you know, what advice does he have for the aspiring entrepreneur out there, you know, in consumer brands? And he goes, make the fucking product. It doesn't cost that much money. Maybe unless you're yeah, no, canning yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah, in the yeah. Alps, that may cost yeah. more. But if you're making a widget, right? right. You, you could scrape together a couple grand, make it. And then he said, you know, and then get people excited about it. Chances are someone know somebody who invests in brands. Yeah. So maybe you get your 10 grand there and maybe right. that's how you start. Like what advice do you have for that young person who kind of has the idea for something? Maybe they have a marketing kind of plan in their head somewhere. What do they do? I, I don't think enough people take advantage of like the digital world that we live in. Hmm. You know, like social media is the ultimate testing platform. Like it's sure you can test thing in a, test things in a focus group where there's like a bunch of people that agree to a survey and come into a room. But the way people behave in those situations is not often reflective of what actually happens in the market. Hmm. Cause it's like a weird scenario. You yeah. know, you're asking people, what do you not like about this? Well, you know, liquid death would have never survived a focus group. <laughs> They'd have been like, oh, this is confusing. It looks like beer. I'd never buy this. Like, but social enables you to test things where you can run a paid ad on social and put $5 behind it if you want. And it's like, let's just say, I don't know, you're going to create a protein bar company. You don't even need to make physical protein bars. You can just design 
What would your protein bar look like? What would the name be? Because you're simulating the way that people would ultimately come to it at scale. Like if you're any kind of CPG company, you're going to be using the internet to market it. Otherwise, what are you doing? Yeah, of course. So in the future, when you're bigger, you're going to be marketing this to people on the internet in in a way very similar to this. And the success of that is probably going to have a huge determining factor on the success of your company. Because it's all about how do you acquire new customers? You don't get to taste test all your potential customers. So they're not going to taste it. Mm-hmm. They're going to react to an ad for it. And are they interested by it? Wow. Are they going to click on it? Yep. Do they care to learn more about it? So anybody can test that. Like you can test wow, what so this smart. looks like, a name, whatever. And even if it's not going to tell you everything, but you might try this and say, hey, well, I did this and it got a thousand likes, which is kind of impressive for a $10 spend. Mm -hmm. Or it might be, hey, I spent 300 bucks, the post got two likes and zero comments over a month. Yeah, scrap that. Yeah, maybe maybe this is something that's not working here. Mm -hmm. At least you're doing something that is so low cost that either A, you can try multiple things. Yeah. You just find cheap ways to test something without having to go the full nine yards to be like, well, I got to figure out how I'm going to make a protein bar and figure out how to put it in a package. And then I'm going to go to a farmer's market. I'm going to try to sell it. Yep. Is that really accurate if it's going to be a successful brand? Because if the name's not right, the packaging's not right, the type of product isn't right. Yeah. All that hard work doesn't mean anything. Sure. It's just wasted time. There's other ways to test if those things are, are viable that are that are easier. I have never even thought about that or heard anyone say that. Like, to me, you know, I go, wait, why would you advertise something? You got to make it first and then you advertise. Like, why would you ever? Because what if somebody wants it? Like, what do you do then? Like, that's, I think, probably how most other people think, too. That is such a great idea, you know? And and big companies do this all the time. Do they really? Like, this is a thing? Well, not in this way. Like, the Cokes and Pepsis and anheuser Bushes of the world, like they have R&D departments. When they're going to launch new products, yeah. they do so much testing and analysis to know what's right and what's not. Now, they they use these, you know, there's these expensive testing networks and systems you can use and there's expensive focus groups and there's all this more clinical testing that a lot of, a lot of them do. And maybe some of them incorporate some of this social stuff as part of it. But... Um, it's a, a lot more capital intensive way to like test an idea before you launch it. Social is just like the everyday person's easy way. Like it's easy to set up an ad account. It's easy to do whatever spend you want. Like it's just a more realistic way of testing something out with the resources, you know, and any person can have basically. Wow. you. I mean, that's... That's worth the interview right there. I mean, I think that's a tip that can really help real people. You know, any final words of advice for the aspiring entrepreneur or the one, you know, or the young entrepreneur who's still trying to figure this out, spending money, not sure when any sales, if they even happen, are going to come in. Like any suggestions for for them or or tips or lessons you've learned along the way? Yeah, I think what we've sort of been talking about, which is find ways to test the viability of your idea. Because I think there's a misconception that, oh, as long as I work hard, it's going to work. But, you know, I, I, I say this a lot. It's like hard work's a waste of time if your idea sucks. You know, it's like you can work as hard as you want, spend as many hours. If what you're making is the wrong thing, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, you know, and you, you have to find some way to, to know, is like, is this working? Is this viable? And even as you're working hard on that thing, you might hit some kind of hurdle and you have to be open to being flexible and pivoting. Like you can't be so locked into this thing and not be flexible at all because you might hit something and then you're just literally never able to get past it when if you just were willing to be a little flexible, you could have found a way around it and, and got to the next level of what it is. Like I've always had to be very flexible with things. like. The original Liquid Death Can didn't look exactly like that. Mm-hmm. Like we went through iterations based on what we were learning of like what was working or not working. And, you know, even as we took our strategy to how we were going to launch, it was like we had this plan. Oh, it's going to be this. Things happen. It's like, oh, no, let's pivot over to this. And it's like, oh, this is working. And, 
you know, like for instance, like we started launching Liquid Death in bars and clubs before retailers because it's mm. like, oh, those guys get the joke. This clearly makes sense in a bar. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, but then when the pandemic hits and there's no bars, now it's going to be a retail play. Yeah. And then how do you adjust your strategy to, to be retail focused, even if that wasn't the original plan? So I think, yeah, you always have to just be flexible and, and realize like what's working, what's not working. Right on, man. Dude, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, lots yeah. of, you know, lots of good things in there. So good. thank you for watching, everybody. Make sure you subscribe, turn on notifications, interviews with the biggest entrepreneurs in the world who give you not only business tips, but life tips too. Every Tuesday, 10 a.m. and available on all podcast platforms. So go check them out. We've got, I mean, you never know who's going to be next. We have athletes, we have artists, we have startup founders, celebrity entrepreneurs, so a lot to learn. So thank you so much for watching, guys. See ya.